Waiting for your orders, Commander. Hello, welcome back. Today I'm covering missile design concepts for new players. After all, it's important to know how to get your missiles to do the things you want them to do. This took longer to make than expected because it's a huge topic that required tons of research and experimentation until I was confident I understood how things work. Of course, just when I felt I had a handle on the material, another video popped up that was better than anything I intended to make. While it didn't cover everything I had in mind, and while I will be retreading some of the same ground, I strongly recommend you watch that video before this one. It was created by Matt Chats, and I will link in the description below to his video. It covers pretty much everything you would want to know about the different missile equipment that you can put onto a missile, and points out some nuances of how things work that are either not immediately obvious or are easy to overlook. On that note, I would very much like to thank Matt, as his video accomplished two very important things for me. Firstly, it clued me into mechanics that I had either missed or overlooked, which in turn improved my understanding of the way missiles behave significantly. Secondly, it allowed me to narrow the focus of this video by covering topics I consider foundational to what I handle here. Seriously, the video is great. Pause this video and go watch his. Again, I'm linking to it in the description below. Watching it takes about half an hour, but I promise you it is worth the time, and I can wait for you. Back? Good. Now we can understand uh, the different components of a missile and what they do. Let's take a moment to discuss the mindset you should have when building missiles for yourself. During our time, I'll be sharing several different missile designs, both their design and how they perform against a target. To be completely clear, I am not saying these designs are what you should strive for. They exist to give you ideas on how you want your missiles to perform. Here we have three similar size 3 hybrid missile designs, which I have dubbed the Bad Touch Block 1, Block 2, and Block 3. All three missiles have a similar cost, are cruise capable, and deliver the same payload. That said, there are differences in their capabilities. The Bad Touch Block 1 features an electro-optical seeker with a secondary steerable extended range active radar seeker. The cruise stage has a range of over 25 kilometers, traveling at 130 meters per second. The sprint stage will begin about 4,760 meters from the target and travel over 598 meters per second, being able to pull just shy of 18G maneuvers. During this terminal stage, it will perform a corkscrew maneuver to avoid any defensive fire. The Bad Touch Block 2 is almost completely identical to the Block 1 in every respect, with the exception of its target detection, abandoning the dual seeker concept. It opts to use a steerable extended range active radar seeker and also an electro optical validator. This validator has been set so that unvalidated targets will be accepted in the event that the validator fails for some reason. The Bad Touch Block 3 is a more serious departure. Like the Block 2, it favors a seeker with a validator, but in this case opts for an electro-optical seeker paired with a command validator. However, as with the Block 2, it will also accept unvalidated targets. The missile's cruise range is also significantly shorter, at just over 15 kilometers. However, it has a cruise speed of over 200 meters per second. The sprint stage is different as well, beginning only 3,000 meters from the target and traveling only 550 meters per second, although it can perform a 29G maneuver when tracking to the target. As with the Block 1 and 2, the Block 3 also uses a corkscrew maneuver to avoid defensive fire. So there are three missiles. Take a moment to predict which missile you think is the best, because now we're heading to the testing range for a simple demonstration of each. Here we are in the testing range, with a voxel light cruiser equipped with 12 of each missile. We also have a corvette to provide visual contact with the targets. These targets are also voxel light cruisers. For purposes of the demonstration, no target mounts missile defenses. For our first fire test, we will be launching six Bad Touch Block 1 missiles at the central target. As a reminder, this missile carries two seekers, a 
primary electro-optical seeker and a secondary extended range steerable active radar seeker. While the missiles travel to the target, I will talk about what you are seeing and why. Missile out. After launching, the missiles orient themselves toward the target and light their cruise stage to travel across the intervening distance. Once they get close to the predicted location of the designated target, the missiles activate their seekers. As the secondary seeker has a detection range of 5 kilometers, it will detect the targets first and select one. When the range closes to 3 kilometers of the target, the primary electro-optical seeker is in range of the targets. If the primary seeker chooses the same target as the secondary seeker, nothing will happen. If it instead chooses a different target, its selection takes priority and it will move to engage this new target. It isn't unusual for one or even two of the missiles to miss, and this happens for several reasons. First, the missiles may switch targets during the sprint stage, and this new target may not be located at a position to provide favorable engagement geometry. Secondly, while the missiles may be able to pull a nearly 18G maneuver, this isn't always enough to ensure a hit. This is especially true when coupled with the third reason, we are attacking from the front which provides us with the narrowest possible target cross-section. You will note that while we targeted the middle voxel with all six of our missiles, the ships we actually hit were random. We will get into specifics later, but this is an example. It is enough to know that the behavior is because the missile seekers are going whichever target they see first, or whichever target they perceive as being the most obvious. As all three targets are in fact identical, this ends up being something of a dice roll, with our Seekers tending to the target that they first see. It is possible to get around this by altering our attack trajectory. By having our missiles direct themselves to one side, we can make them more discerning in which target they hit by making one of the targets more obvious. Sending it. In this example, the mo missiles will favor the target that we have selected Missile for two reasons. First off, it is closer than the other targets, and thus it is easier to detect. Secondly, because of the position it is relative to the missiles, it blocks the view of the other two ships. This makes it quite hard for the missiles to perceive the other two targets. When the missiles arrive at the target, you may see one or two missiles strike the other targets, but this is likely because they missed their primary target and set to re-engage if possible. However, because the primary target presents such a large cross-section, most of the missiles should strike right on target. Next, we're testing the Bad Touch Block 2, which uses the active radar seeker with an electro-optical validator. As with the previous test, we will begin by launching six missiles at the center target, and I will talk about what is happening. Go ahead, Command. Missile out. The beginning phase will be exactly the same. The missiles will launch, reorient, and cruise toward the target. Once they are close to the target, they will activate their seeker and begin to search. Upon locating a target, once they are within 4.7 kilometers from the chosen target, they will begin their sprint stage and corkscrew maneuver. Here you will also likely see them maneuvering to engage specific ships. However, unlike last time, there will not be a target switch once they are within 3 kilometers of range. This is because their radar seeker is the primary and the electro-optical sensor is set up as a validator, simply checking the target of the radar seeker to ensure that it is a valid target. If there was chaff and the missile had locked onto that, it would switch targets back to one of the three voxels, but that is not a factor here. The missiles will continue to the chosen target and try to strike it. As before, it isn't unusual for some missiles to miss, and the reasons are the same. You will also notice that the Block 2 has the same targeting discrimination problem as the Block 1. Again, this is because all three ships are of the same class. They are all voxels. As with the last example, we can help with this by changing our attack trajectory to increase the likelihood that we will lack on to the intended ship. 
Last up is the Bad Touch Block 3. As you recall, this missile has an electro-optical seeker paired with a command validator. Unlike the previous test, we will be firing two missiles at each of the three targets. We will also be starting with comms deactivated for this test. Send your traffic. Sending it. While the beginning phases may appear the same as the previous two examples, take a moment to notice that as the missile launches, our ship's communications will turn on. This is so that our ship can communicate with the missile, and it is important to keep in mind as it will increase the ship's signature, and losing communications with our missile for any reason will cause the validator to cease functioning. Regardless, each missile is headed for its intended target. Once it is close enough, the seeker will activate and search for a target. Upon finding a target, it will ask the validator, and thus the command ship, if it has the correct target. Because of this, once it activates its sprint stage, it has already locked on to the intended target and will head directly for it. It is still possible for these missiles to miss the target, but their better maneuverability makes a hit more likely. As these missiles already have superb target discrimination, our second test will simulate something else. What happens when the command ship loses contact with the targets? This will be done by firing two missiles at each target as before. However, once the missiles have launched, we will turn off all our radars. Missile out. Got you five by five. No more missiles, Commander. What are our orders, Commander? Got you five by five. Initially, everything seems to be going normally, but things rapidly change once the missile is able to detect its targets. Once the seizure chooses a target, it tries to ask the command validator if it has chosen correctly. However, the launching ship cannot detect the targets, so it has no way of knowing. We've lost our target discrimination, but the attack is still carried out against whichever ship the missile chose. This is an important detail to understand. If the missile was set to reject unvalidated targets, these missiles would never engage anything. Which of the three missile designs is the best? Well, that answer depends on what you want the missile to be able to do. Personally, I find it tempting to call the Bad Touch Block 3 the best design, because it has the best target discrimination, which I find appealing. When I fire weapons at a specific target, there is a reason I am shooting at that specific thing. Perhaps the other targets are already crippled, or perhaps this is simply the most threatening thing I face. In these instances, it can be frustrating to watch my missiles hit the wrong target, piling an excessive amount of damage into something that may not even be a threat. While there are ways to help avoid this problem, it is worth pointing out that I don't always have the time or composure to plot an attack using TRPs or waypoints. That said, the Block 3 is not infallible. As shown, losing contact with the target makes it lose its target discrimination. This plays into why its cruise stage is at so different from the Block 1 and 2. Targets at long range are more difficult to maintain a track on, and if the track is lost, we lose the targeting discrimination. A slower cruise stage would have a similar effect, as the target might evade and break contact before the missile arrives. As such, the Block 3 trades range for speed, seeking to reach the target before it can break contact. This leads to a question though. Does this missile really need to be cruise capable? The ability to fire using TRPs and waypoints is nice, but the lower range does reduce how many options are available when firing in these modes. 
You should notice that, while not demonstrated in our test firings, the command validator does not function when the missile is fired in waypoint mode. That being the case, how likely is it that the missile will be used in that situation rather than firing directly upon the target? Options are nice, but options come with a cost. If the missile is frequently being fired in waypoint mode, you are spending points on a command validator that you aren't using. If you are always using direct fire, then you are paying for cruise guidance that you aren't using. If you are using TRPs, then you need to consider if that use case is important enough to include a cruise guidance system that isn't being taken full advantage of. What about the bad touch block 1 and 2? While we cannot say the behavior is completely identical, it is similar enough that the differences are mostly academic. So why might you pick the block 1 over the cheaper block 2? The cost difference isn't that great, only 3 points. But that is about 10% the total cost of the missile, which is hardly insignificant. If you carry many missiles, a 10% savings per missile adds up quickly. Surely there is no reason to ever use the block 1, right? Well, it isn't that simple. Remember when I said the steerable extended range radar seeker has a detection range of 5 kilometers? That's a lie. Okay, maybe not a lie, but it is an oversimplification. The truth is that is the maximum range. If the missile encounters jamming, that range is reduced as the radar seeker must contend with ghost targets. With strong enough jamming, it might be reduced to the point that the seeker is completely unable to detect the target at all. The electro-optical validator isn't able to select targets for the missile, only validate targets selected by the radar seeker. This brings us back to the block 1, which has two seekers. If the radar seeker is jammed and unable to detect the target, there is a chance that the electro-optical seeker will be successful. While this will prevent the missile from entering its cruise stage until it is 3 kilometers from the target, that is certainly better than failing to make any attack at all. Better still, electro-optical sensors are completely immune to jamming, which makes them highly reliable. While they can be countered by the OSP's Dazzlers, carrying a Dazzler takes up a slot that could be used by a different point defense able to accidentally shoot down incoming missiles. And in any case, if the electro-optical sensor of the Block 1 is blinded, then hopefully it is already headed toward the target, and the radar seeker will still be able to pick it up. As you can see, this isn't a clear-cut situation. Which missile is best is really the wrong question to ask. The real thing you should be asking is, what do I want this missile to be able to do, and how much am I willing to pay for that? Now seems a good time to cover components a little more in depth. Specifically, let's talk about guidance, sensors, payloads, and other additions. We will also briefly cover some other options you can set for your missiles, such as terminal maneuvers. Guidance is a good place to start, as there are only two options, direct and cruise. Direct guidance makes a missile function much like any other weapon in the game, requiring you to fire the missile directly at a target. The missile will automatically be assigned a flight path that should allow it to directly contact the target by taking into account its current location and velocity. This is only a prediction, however, and may result in a miss should the target alter its speed, direction of travel, or both significantly after the missile is assigned. Direct guidance is free, however not increasing the cost of your missile at all, and it is a good place to begin when you first start using missiles. Cruise guidance is more capable. It can be fired directly at a target just like direct guidance missiles. However, it can operate in two additional modes, firing at a target using a target reference point as an intermediate waypoint, or by assigning waypoints manually. This takes more practice to really get the hang of, and can be difficult to do well in the heat of battle, but it gives you a lot more control over how your missile will approach the target, allowing you to come from surprising angles, or use space terrain to block defensive fire. When fired in waypoint mode, missiles will activate their seekers upon reaching their final waypoint, so this also gives you control over when the missile's seekers will become active. Because cruise guidance is more capable, it comes with an added cost of two points. As such, if you rarely make use of TRPs or waypoints, you may want to stick with direct guidance. Once you have selected a type of guidance, 
several other options become available to you. Offensive or defensive roll, cold or hot lunch, target loss behavior, and terminal maneuvers. New missiles are sent to an offensive roll by default, meaning they are intended to attack another ship. If switched to a defensive roll, these missiles will be used to defend your ship from incoming enemy missile attacks. Switching to a defensive roll will also bring up several new options for you to select between, but we will not cover any of these today. Cold or hot launch determines if a missile launches with its engines ignited or not. Hot launch missiles get off the line more rapidly, but require more clearance for the launcher as a result of their higher exit velocity. Target loss behavior is fairly straightforward. This merely determines if the missile will try to locate a new target should it lose contact with the intended target, or if it will self-destruct. Lastly, we have our terminal maneuver, which enables a missile to evade enemy defensive fire once it is near the target. You may pick between none, weave, or corkscrew maneuvers. None is exactly what it sounds like. The missile will attract directly to the target without attempting to evade defensive fire. This makes it easier to shoot the missile down, but it also makes it less likely the missile will miss the target. It is also the default mode, costing nothing to use. A weave maneuver is slightly more expensive, causing the missile to weave back and forth as it homes in on the target. Although this will evade significantly more defensive fire than doing nothing, because it simply turns left and right, some point defense fire is still likely to hit. This maneuver is fairly simple to pull off, however, making it only slightly more likely to miss the target. The corkscrew maneuver is the most extreme and expensive terminal maneuver, and it also is the one most likely to evade defensive fire. As it changes both the missile's pitch and yaw, point defensive have a significant amount of difficulty engaging missiles using this maneuver. Just remember to give your missile's engines enough maneuverability to carry out the maneuver, or you significantly increase the chances that you will miss. With missile guidance covered, let's move on to sensor packages. Before we get into the different types of sensors that can be placed on a missile, it is worth taking a moment to cover primary seekers, secondary seekers, and validators. Seekers, as the name implies, are sensors that are set to seek out targets for the missile. They look ahead of the missile's flight path, searching for enemy ships and guide the missile after a target has been identified. The difference between a primary seeker and a secondary seeker is which of the two sensor packages is given priority in the event that there is a targeting conflict. When the seekers cannot agree on which target to engage, the primary seeker is given priority. In the event that the primary seeker cannot locate a target, but the secondary seeker can, the secondary seeker can take over guidance. In general, you should make your most capable seeker the primary seeker, and only use secondary seekers that search for targets using a different detection method from the primary. If you have missiles that are sent to defensive, make sure that your seekers are set to accept small targets, or they will not work. Validators are something completely different. When a sensor package is set to validation, it will not look for targets itself. Instead, it will look at context the seeker has found and decide which, if any, are valid targets. Like with secondary seekers, you should only use validators that recognize targets through a de different detection means from your primary seeker. Using an active radar validator to validate the target of an active radar seeker isn't particularly useful, as it will merely confirm that the selected target is, in fact, a radar contact. Using a wake validator, however, would check if the suspected target has an engine signature, which would then imply it is not merely a cloud of chaff. When it comes to using validators, one big question to consider is if you should accept unvalidated targets or not. Unvalidated targets are accepted by default. Note that even when using this setting, a missile will never opt to engage an unvalidated target if there is at least one validated target to engage. Given the option of validated and unvalidated targets, the missile will always opt for valid targets. It will only attempt to engage unvalidated targets if there are only such things presented with. Allowing attacks against unvalidated targets is a good backup, allowing missiles to at least attempt to make an attack if they fail to validate targets for some reason. Rejecting unvalid targets tightens the constraints on what a missile will actually be allowed to attack. This technically gives you more control, but it does mean your missile is less likely to find a valid target. 
This may be desirable when coupled with a command validator, especially for missiles intended for short-range engagements or to be launched at enemy ships, which may be in close proximity to friendly ships. As the command validator ceases to function if communication to the missile is lost, such as if the target is carrying an E-70 interrupter or the launching ship unexpectedly loses its communications antenna, rejecting unvalidated targets improves safety by ensuring the missile will not accidentally lock onto friendly ships. Safety can be further improved by setting the missile to self-destruct if the missile misses its target instead of allowing it to seek new targets. Command seekers are great because they allow a missile to rely on the systems carried by your ships, which are far more capable than what can be crammed into a tiny missile. This costs the missile one of its primary strengths, however, its autonomy. It cannot function without maintaining communications with the launching ship, making it vulnerable to communications jamming. It also relies on the launching ship's understanding of where a target is located. As such, if the target is not locked, the uncertainty in the target's position will make the missile fly erratically during the terminal phase and make it very unlikely to hit the target. Also, command seekers can only be fired directly at a target or using a target reference point, not in waypoint mode. Command validators sidestep some of these issues. When validating a seeker, you no longer have to maintain a lock on the target and the missile will maintain its autonomy. This is because the missile is guided to the target by the seeker, and the command validator merely validates that the target is correct. If communications are jammed, the validator will cease to function, but the seeker may still attempt to engage on its own if that is permitted. Finally, missiles with command validators may be fired in waypoint mode, although this does cause the validator to cease functioning. Radar is the most basic method a missile can use to detect targets with the most options available to you, and also the most easily defeated. It is countered by chaff, active countermeasures, and jamming. This isn't as dire as it seems. For one, radar is very cheap, and these problems can be overcome by using a validator. We should also acknowledge that the enemy can only use chaff and active countermeasures as long as they have them on the ship, or jamming if they have that capability. While all are fairly common, damage and battle expenditures make them less likely to be encountered as the conflict drags on. Radar seekers tend to favor locking on to the largest radar signature present. There are a number of things that can increase a ship's signature, but in general, the larger the ship is, the larger its signature will be. In the event that two ships present a similar signature, the seekers will pick at random. We should also take a moment to note that jamming works by presenting the seeker with phantom targets for it to track. This can be devastating if you are using a radar seeker by itself without a secondary seeker or validator on a hybrid missile, as the seeker will detect these phantom targets and promptly enter into its sprint stage to engage, mounting either a secondary seeker or a validator that isn't also a radar seeker is all enough to make the missile realize that these targets are the result of jamming and ignore them. A radar validator works the same as a seeker in every respect, however it will not cause the missile to favor larger targets. Instead, it merely checks if the target selected by the seeker has a radar signature or not. It is worth noting that semi-active radar seekers should be better able to cut through jamming, as they are relying on a powerful illuminator carried by a ship. As of yet, I have been unable to devise a test to check if this is true or not. Anti-radiation seekers, often referred to as ARAD, home in on an enemy's radar emissions and jamming emissions, although they can be set to simply home in on jamming. When looking for radar emissions, they can be confused by active countermeasures, however they completely ignore both chaff and flares. Since radar is something an enemy will want to be using, and jamming is also quite useful, you can be confident that anything emitting a radar or jamming signal is a target of some sort. This makes ARAD sensors useful when used as a, both a seeker and a validator. Setting these up specifically to track a jamming source can be a good way to eliminate a jammer and thus avoid problems caused by them. Notice that ARAD sensors can be easily defeated by simply switching the radar and or jammer off. However, this relies on the enemy's situational awareness. It's possible they won't notice the missile is incoming or fail to identify how it is homing in on the target. Even then, 
these are systems that the enemy would likely prefer to remain active, so any downtime in their operation is beneficial even if the downtime is temporary. Because of how easily ARAD is defeated, it tends to be work best when it is mixed in as a few missiles as part of a larger salvo that use different forms of guidance. As turning off radars and jammers in such a scenario severely compromises a target's ability to defend itself from an attack. I should point out here that ARAD missiles will not home in on targeting illuminators like the spotlight or floodlight. This is probably technically a bug, although its impact is extremely minor, as there is currently no way to determine if the enemy has an illuminator active. Still, this is good information to know. Electro-optical sensors, both seekers and validators, physically look at a target. When fired at a specific target, they will try to engage send target, provided that the ship has been identified, losing this ability if the track remains unknown. This also does not work when fired using waypoints. They also have a bad habit of being decoyed by other enemy ships, especially ships of the same class as the target. However, they are otherwise very reliable and immune to countermeasures and jamming, only being countered by the OSP's dazzlers at this point. This makes them quite reliable. However, said reliability also makes them the most costly option you can choose. As such, they tend to be the go-to tool on hybrid missiles, especially size 3 hybrids, since such designs are already fairly expensive, and thus the expensive guidance is worth the added cost to ensure that a 50-point missile isn't simply flushed down the drain due to guidance failure. Wake seekers search for engine signatures. Like radar seekers, they are easily countered, though in this case through the use of flares. However, since wake seekers are less common, enemies are less likely to bring many of them. Another way to counter wake seekers is to stop the engines entirely, although this can result in a hit as the target is now stationary and the missile might still cross its path. Similar to radar seekers, a wake seeker will tend to hit the target with the largest engine signature that it can detect. In general, I don't recommend using wake seekers due to their low detection range. However, they make for excellent validators when paired with a radar seeker. This setup is a cheap way to defeat countermeasures, as the radar seeker ensures that the target has a radar signature, while the wake validator checks for an engine signature. While this is not 100% reliable, since chaff will still work if the ship is stationary, it is a cheap enough option to be worth considering. Now that we've discussed guidance and sensors, what sort of boom is the missile packing? High explosive impact warheads are the most standard simple, reliable, and affordable. They can go on nearly any offensive missile. Keep in mind that the larger you make the warhead, the more damage it will do in addition to gaining additional armor penetration. Since these warheads just explode really big, you don't need to worry about where you specifically strike the target. However, HE warheads do tend to like striking on the side since the explosion won't penetrate through the ship like a kinetic penetrator. Still, any hit is a good hit, ruining armor in the struck location and damaging the hull directly. High explosive kinetic penetrators are much fancier, and thus more expensive. These missiles gain better armor penetration the faster they are traveling, and explode on their way through the ship. This has the potential to hit multiple compartments with just one strike, and can be absolutely devastating. However, overpenetration becomes a problem against smaller ships or when you hit from the side. Ideally, a kinetic penetrator wants to hit front to back or back to front. HE frag warheads are used against enemy missiles and are almost completely ineffective against enemy warships. As such, they should only be used in the defensive role. They blow up, throwing out a shrapnel cloud to destroy enemy missiles. The enhanced lethality option for the warhead does exactly the same thing, however the fragmentation cloud is larger and enhances their lethality significantly against enemy missiles. What about other components? These are largely self-explanatory and I don't have much to add to the discussion except when it comes to the fast startup module. This is an interesting case, since it is a cheap way to give a missile a 66% programming speed boost in exchange for a 20% failure rate. This is very helpful for ships where missiles are intended to augment your primary firepower rather than serve as the main weapon. 
A 20% failure rate seems very high, but it turned out not to be much of a problem in the tests that I was running. Keep in mind that since the programming boost is percentage-based, the effect is greater the longer the missile would normally take to program, meaning that you get the best return for it when it is placed on a size 3 hybrid missile. I do not recommend taking this addition for dedicated missile platforms, however. On those ships, you are better served by taking strike planning centers, missile buses, and or parallel missile interfaces, since they are overall more efficient, will grant you a bigger boost, and don't come with the same risk of missile failure. So that is a lot of information, but now we can finally get to the point of this video. What should you be thinking about while designing your missiles? A good place to start is to think about which ship will be carrying your missile, and what sort of targets the missile is intended for. A missile design that is right for a frigate is not necessarily what a cruiser missile carrier would want. By the same token, a missile intended to take out something like an Axford or a Solomon has different requirements from something intended for smaller, squishier targets. You can, of course, make a more general purpose missile that can be employed against a wide range of targets, but such a design is likely to be less capable than something that is purpose made to fill a specific role. Terminal maneuvers can make smaller targets more difficult to hit. However, smaller targets don't mount as many point defenses and are more likely to sustain catastrophic damage as even a single strike gets through. Something like an Axford or Solomon takes much more to knock out, and are much more likely to mount either significant defenses themselves, or be escorted by something that does. I would recommend that you start out by making your missiles as cheap as possible. Come up with a missile concept, design it, then bring it to a skirmish match against an AI opponent to see how the missile does. Based off of those results, you can then alter your missile design to increase its survivability or capabilities. Then, bring it into matches against other people. Repeat the process. Sometimes it pays to have two versions of the same missile. One that's cruise capable, and one that isn't. Not every target encountered will require a cruise capable missile, and taking direct guidance version is one way to shave points off the overall budget of your missiles. Just be sure this makes sense for your launching platform. A squishy frigate is maybe not going to appreciate being asked to place itself in the line of fire to use these missiles. Conversely, a ship like an Axford might only be equipped with direct fire missiles. This is especially true if the missiles are intended for short range use. When using missiles as your primary weapon, it is also worth considering taking missiles with several different detection methods. Electro-optical seekers may seem like a silver bullet, but that quickly changes after you see what the OSP's dazzlers do to them. Different approaches overcome different defenses. Hybrids are very powerful, but laser-based PD is quite effective at targeting their sprint stage. However, laser-based PD is more easily overwhelmed than conventional defenses. As a final note, do not overlook jammers. Aiming a jammer at the enemy ships before your missiles are in range of their defenses increases the survivability of your missiles significantly. Since these jammers can be used every time you launch a missile attack, this ends up being a very efficient way to improve point defense penetration. In a similar vein, decoy launchers are expensive, however one or two missiles mounting them can provide cover for an entire salvo, increasing the effectiveness of your attacks overall. Standing by. away. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> this is so worthless. Well, I suppose at least it looked impressive. <laughs> <laughs>